All right, so tonight we're going to learn about ventilation. Now, I mentioned in my email when I sent it out that ventilation is one of my, my favorite topics. It really is. There's so much to it. There's so much to know. We do an entire two-day course on it. We could do a, a two-week course on ventilation. There's so much uh, knowledge to, to, about it that we can have. Um, it's all based on science. It's, you know, it's been around for some time now, but uh, you know, using it right and using it effectively, it has so many benefits on the, on the fire scene. So um, for me, the use of positive pressure ventilation is one of the biggest steps forward that we've taken, especially when using it in conjunction with a fire attack. So I'm really happy you folks have been able to join us today. And uh, yeah, let's get underway. So when we talk about ventilation, what we're actually talking about is the controlled and coordinated removal of heat, smoke, and gases, and other airborne contaminate, uh, contaminants from a structure. Um, basically, ventilation tactics, they need to be under, undertaken in a as a coordinated effort by the incident commander. The co coordination is the key here. This isn't something that we can go around breaking windows, uh, uh, opening doors, if there isn't a plan. Any opening you're going to make in a structure, you have to think of as ventilation. You're adding air into a, uh, an uncontrolled situation, which is the fire. So with ventilation, it needs to be a decision made by the incident commander, and it has to be a coordinated activity. Uh, what we do when we, when we ventilate a structure is we're replacing the, the, the uh, escaping gases with a cooler, cleaner, oxygen-rich air, something that is actually breathable. We all know that the byproducts of combustion, smoke, not breathable, very dangerous. It's the primary cause of death in, in structure fire. You don't, it's not the burning, it's the smoke that's going to get you. So by, by removing this smoke, we're giving any occupants a good chance of survival. We are, and, and by doing ventilation effectively, we can actually control this fire uh, and it gives us a better chance to, uh, to, it keeps our firefighters safe and it also gives us a better chance to get a handle on it. But again, must be a planned and systematic process when we're doing ventilation. So again, why do we ventilate? Helps remove hot gases from the fire compartment. So by removing those hot gases, we end up cooling the building. The, the, uh, <clears throat> we also provide breathable air for those people that are trapped. You've got an occupant inside. They may have found a little pocket below to the ground where they're able to survive for some period of time. Uh, this is giving them a better chance of survival when we get there. Uh, it also makes it easier for us as firefighters, if we're going to go interior on a search team, it makes, us, it makes it easier for us to to find them and find the seat of the fire. So we know, so we have a better visibility when we go into the structure. Uh, it contributes to a faster knockdown and safer because we've removed that smoke and that, uh, that smoke, which, which is a fuel, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit here, but it removes it from the structure, and, may, and, and so that's no longer going to be a, a, a hazard for our firefighters. It makes us more effective with fire suppression. It improves our efficiency when searching. Like I said, we've got better visibility. We can go in a lot of times standing up as, a, as opposed to crawling along the ground and trying to find our way through, through a structure. Uh, and it, but the, the downside, of course, is that uh, with the fire uh, triangle, we know that one of the components of that fire triangle is oxygen, right? We need a fuel, we need heat, and we need oxygen. And, that, and so what we're doing is we're effectively uh, adding oxygen to a fire. And that can also make the, the fire gain in size, and it can, uh, it can definitely have very negative uh, outcomes if it's not performed properly or if it's timed poorly. So the one thing that you'll hear me saying a lot uh, at all sorts of different courses, and if you've taken courses with me in the past, you may have already heard me say it, smoke is fuel. When I ask what is smoke, I want to always hear smoke is fuel. Uh, smoke is something that can, that, uh, can combust, it, can, it can, can increase fire spread throughout a structure. So we need to think of it as that. It's not just the byproduct of combustion, it still is a fuel that can, that can, that can aid in fire development. So I've got on this uh, a little, uh, just kind of a, a little breakdown of a few of the, ma of the major gases that are, that you can find within smoke. Uh, acrolein, benzene, hydrogen cyanide, carbon monoxide. <clears throat> so you can see here when we look at the flammable range for those, uh, for those gases, we're looking at anywhere from 1% to 74% as being the sweet spot for where smoke can actually ignite. That's, uh, that's the percentage in the atmosphere, right? When we talk about the upper, uh, uh, upper flammability limit and the lower flammability limit, 
it has a huge range where that smoke could, could ignite. Um, so we need to we need to consider that when we're when we're looking at smoke, we need to consider it as a fuel, and we need to understand that we need to remove that hazard from the structure. Uh, it can be ignitable at temperatures under as well as you can see from the from here. It can be ignitable at temperatures at 450 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not very hot when you're thinking about a structure fire. So we ha so it's a so it's a huge hazard can ignite at low temperatures and has a huge flammability range. So the other thing we need to think about is what, is, what else does smoke contain? Smoke contains aerosols, things like water, hydrocarbons, oil, that's little oil, little drops of oil, droplets of oil. We have a lot of petrochemicals inside of our houses now. Uh, that's what makes up our furniture. That's what's making up our, you know, the couches, the upholstery, so things like that. Um, when those burn, these hydrocarbons get into that smoke. Um, some oils have self-ignition temperatures as low as 460 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, very low temperatures, not much is needed, and that smoke can ignite. And, it, and that ign and igniting smoke is what is going to injure our firefighters. 70% uh, of our smoke is, is, is a particulate. So you're looking at soot, which is typically black, ash, that's white, and then a mixture of fibers, dust, and pulp. So Again, we've got gases, aerosols, particulates, all all making this wonderful thing called smoke, which, uh, which again, is what kills us in fires. So when we mix uh, when we mix smoke with the right temperature and the uh, and uh, the right mix the, the right quantity of smoke, the not too rich, not too lean, it's just right. That's when our smoke will ignite. That's what's happening in the photo here. You see the smoke on the left coming out of the building windows. Uh, a li little bit more air was added to it and it got into that perfect flammability range and off she goes. That smoke is now on fire and that fire is now throughout the structure. So when we're looking at smoke, we need to consider like a lot of, a lot of different factors about that smoke. And I'm not gonna get into smoke reading here and, and what you're looking at with smoke too much. Those are for other courses when you go for team leader uh, and some of your uh, upper officer courses, you definitely need to understand how to read smoke and what the smoke signs are telling you. But one of the things we can look at is, is when we're looking at the smoke is the rate of change. Once we do something, is the situation getting better or getting worse? Uh, is that change happening in minutes or is it happening in seconds? Is the box, the, the envelope of the building, is it still absorbing heat or has it absorbed as much heat as it can and is it starting to kick it back? Um, so some of the results that can happen from these changes, uh, depending on how, how rapidly it's happening, we can experience things like flashover, uh, a smoke explosion and a backdraft. Now smoke explosion and backdraft are two different things, although if you're in one, you're not gonna care which is which. Um, and I'm going to get into a little bit about flashovers and backdraft, not as much about smoke explosions, but understanding that that smoke, much like uh, a, uh, if you think about the sawmills, they catch fire and then they start exploding. It, it can act in very much the same way where it started, where it ignites so quickly and, and travels so fast, rapidly, that it actually creates an explosion. So poorly, by poorly ventilating the building, uh, sorry, by properly ventilating the building, we're gonna remove that heat, smoke, gases, and we're gonna decrease the likelihood of those negative outcomes, like the flashover, the smoke explosion, and the backdraft. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a few about a couple of key concepts that are really important to understand when we're talking about ventilation. Um, and the first one I wanna talk about is a ventilation limited fire, okay? So when we talk about vent limited fire, what that means is that the fire has all of the fuel that it needs. So it's got enough stuff inside to burn, but it's limited by the amount of oxygen that's available. So this, the fire will actually start dying down because it just has no more oxygen to keep it going. It has all the fuel. It'll still have the couches still there. You've still got all sorts of wonderful uh, lampshades and things that have to go. It just hasn't gone yet because the oxygen isn't there to support combustion. Uh, what you've got in a vent limited fire, huge amounts of thermal em energy. So very, very hot, hot, hot inside. Uh, you've got, it is still has all the heat as well that's required for that fire. Um, when, if we were to introduce sufficient oxygen into a vent limited fire, uh, the, it would likely result in things like flashover or the fire will transition to a, the fully involved stage very, very rapidly. Uh, flashover is about as rapid as you can get, where everything reaches its, its ignition point at the same time inside that room, and the entire room flashes and goes on to fire. So the way we manage vent-limited fires, we, we manage it by 
controlling flow paths. So making sure that we don't have uh, you know air getting into the into the structure that we don't want to get into the structure, and by using specific cooling techniques. And one of those cooling techniques is, is penciling from the exterior and using a straight stream up into the thermal line and banking it off of the uh, through the thermal line off the ceiling. And what's going to happen then is it's going to cool those gases without disrupting them too much, and it's it's going to convert that water into steam. And it's going to very, very quickly and, effect and effectively cool that fire. And for those of you who've gone to exterior live fire, interior live fire, you've gone through our cold starts, you've had a chance to see how little water it takes. Now, of course, there's a lot more on fire and a lot more we need to, buy in to put out, but it takes very, very limited. It, you know, the, that water is going to expand 1,700 times. It's now going to take up the rest of that oxygen that's in there, and it's, it's going to cool very effectively. So, with these vent limited fires, again, a couple of negative occurrences can happen. And two that I'm going to talk about right now are the backdraft and the flash. So the backdraft occurs when the building's charged with hot gases. Most of the available oxygen in that room has now been consumed. So again, we're at that vent limited stage. It may still have tons of fuel, but there is no more oxygen. The introduction of oxygen can cause an explosion. And that explosion occurs because it rapidly grows. It grows so quickly that it's basically creates, uh, it creates so much pressure that an explosion is the result. Firefighters need to remove as much heat and unburnt products of combustion as possible. So that unburnt products of combustion, smoke. We need to get that out of the building as quickly as possible and we need to cool it very, very quickly to prevent that from happening. So we want to make a small opening, typically a window, and we want to cool, again, using a straight stream, penciling in through that window into that thermal layer and try to get that heat down very, as quickly as we can. Uh, by doing that, we definitely lessen the, the, the potential for that backdraft happening. With a flashover, we're looking where the, tra the fire, it's a transition from the fire that's grown, uh, the, the, from uh, igniting one type of fuel um, to one where all of our exposed surfaces have ignited. So everything reaches its, its ignition point. Uh, all of a sudden, the entire room flashes up and everything seems like it's on fire. You need to understand and recognize the, condi the, the conditions of a potential flashover. Uh, a lot of this is covered as well in fire behavior and the fire behavior component. So understand it, know it. Uh, and definitely learn it because flashovers are what kill firefighters very often as well. You don't want to enter an environment that has signs of an impending flashover. If you see off-gassing from all, all of the different uh, component uh, things inside of a room, you see the desk is starting to off-gas, the, the tables are starting to off-gas, that, that thermal layer is starting to come low. Now we're getting into con conditions are becoming right where we may end up in a flashover situation. Um, again, with that situation, what we want to do is we want to try to cool and we want to use, uh, we could use something like a transitional attack to cool the fire compartment and we ventilate the hot smoking gases out and then we can enter. We don't want to be pushing our firefighters into these situations. We need to, very, we definitely need to exercise great caution when we're doing this as well. Um, we need to, these transitional attacks where we start on the exterior, we pencil from the exterior um, and <clears throat> by penciling from the exterior, we cool it. Then we start the vent fan. We're able, we're able to now remove that hot smoking gases, and then we're looking at doing the entry into the building, right? So I talked about vent limited fires. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about fuel limited fires, um, although they don't come into play quite as often when we're talking about ventilation. When we're talking about a fuel limited fire, again, it's got all the oxygen it needs, but it's limited by the amount of fuel that's available for burning. If you look at this house right now, all the windows are broken, everything's on fire, it's starting to come out, it's definitely got all the oxygen it needs. Eventually it's going to consume all of that fuel, everything inside the house and every building component of that house, and now it has nothing left that it can burn. Uh, so I just wanted to show you fuel limited as opposed to vent limited. But when we're talking about our dangers, the vent limited fire is the one that's actually going to end up causing us more problems, right? The one thing we do need to realize though with the fuel limited fire, when it has all the oxygen it needs, it's typically because that fire is already self venting. We didn't have to make openings into it. We came out and there's fire out the windows. Uh, what that means is we have an uncontrolled flow path. That fire is going everywhere uh, that it wants to go. 
right? And so if we have any, any, any extra openings are also going to establish new flow paths throughout that structure. So even if, so even if you have a couple of windows broken out of structure, does not mean that we can go ahead and burn, uh, open every window up. That's a great way to lose that house and everything inside of it. Um, so we'd want to be careful about opening any extra uh, flow paths for it. And now I've been talking about flow path quite a bit, so let's talk about flow path. So it's a very important component. This is a very imp important thing to understand. We need to understand how air travels inside of a building uh, at any time, but specifically when it's on fire and how that can both, uh, both uh, have negative consequences and can be a positive for us when we know how to use it properly. So a flow path, the most easy, the easiest way to explain it, it's, it's an area in the structure where the heat, smoke, gases, and the air, and the air flow from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure. Okay, this is we're, now we're going to get into a little bit about science here, right? Where you know we start talking about how pressure moves, how how uh, things of higher pressure are going to seek out that balance, and they're going to seek out areas of lower pressure so that they can then equalize themselves. So. It, like the, the science involved in this very, you know, it's, though basic, it's very important to understand it. Um, typically when we're looking at a flow path, we're, we want, what we're looking for is a unidirectional flow path. So hopefully we're having a flow path, a single unidirectional flow path between the fire and the opening to the outside. Um, we want it to make, we don't want to have much in, in the way there. We don't, and we want to have it as straight as possible. Um, it also could be a bi-directional flow path where you've got the one area and let's say that we <clears throat> we didn't open one of the windows on the picture that you see on your screen right now. Um, that it, Then you'll have the door will both be an inlet and an outlet where we're going to be putting air into it and the, re and the air is then going to be also pushing out through the top. All right. So that's yeah, So those hot smoking gases are forced back towards the entrance and towards any firefighters that might be entering. Um, again, very dangerous for them. The firefighter might be able to identify what's called the neutral plane. That's the place where the outlet and the inlet meet. So it's right, it's typically going to be somewhere in the middle there. Um, and you can, you can tell as well whether you're getting more coming out or more going in by looking at that neutral, uh, by looking at that neutral plane. So the flow path will be determined by the building design. Um, and we have all sorts of different, again, building construction, um, another thing that's very important to understand when we're talking about ventilation and building designs have changed over time. We've got a lot more open spaces which are going to impact our ventilation. Uh, much less like the, you know, the, the hallway where we can close all the doors to the bedrooms or all the other rooms to the house uh, and just have a straight flow path uh, out, you know, out, uh, out a window. That's, that's, that's not as easy anymore in today's building. So the design of that building is certainly going to impact uh, you know, the way the, flow, the, the air is going to flow inside of it. Um, Oops. So when we look at uh, operations uh, that are conducted in the exhaust portion of the flow path, that's going to place our firefighters at a significant risk of injury or death. We do not want firefighters operating outside of the building where that smoke, hot smoking gases are coming from in the same way that we don't want to have bi-directional flow, meaning we don't want that, the, the, we don't want the door to both be both the inlet and the outlet for the air in that building because firefighters are coming through that, that hot smoking gases rushing up over their heads while they're entering a structure, if they've got that bi-directional flow, that is fuel, that can, that can ignite, that can cause rollover and in some cases flash over and it can, and it can seriously harm our people. The flow path also should, it should be kept as straight as possible. Any time we add a bend, a turn, anything into that flow path, we're creating what's called turbulence and, and it's going to make the ventilation less, uh, less effective. All right. So, and then when we're making the opening, we're looking at making that opening for the exit and we want it to be as close to the seat of the fire as possible. More key concepts, windward and leeward. These are things we need to understand again because uh, knowing uh, because understanding our natural ventilation and what's happening outside uh, can impact the way our decisions when we decide to ventilate. Um, so the windward side that's the side or direction from from where the wind is blowing from. Okay, so windward that's where the wind is blowing from. Leeward that's the protected side. It's the opposite side of, <clears throat> from it's opposite from where the wind is blowing. Um, Typically, that's the side of the building that the plume of smoke is going to move towards. That's the leeward side. All right. And pressure. Here we get into the science again. 
Um, please forgive me. I had to actually create a lot of these, so the, <laughs> my pictures aren't great. But what I'm trying to show you with this slide here is how when, we're, when we have a fire, fire will increase the pressure inside of that structure. Um, the pressure created by the products of, of the pressure is created by the products of combustion, the heat, the smoke, the gases. They what they're going to do is actually increase the pressure inside of the envelope that's on fire. All right, <clears throat> the press, pressure will always be higher on the inside of a building on fire than it is on the outside of that building, and that pressure will try to equalize. Uh, it's going to look. It's going to look to move from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. It will seek a path outside, and if it doesn't have a path outside, it will. Con it will look for one. It could be through vents. It could be through crawl spaces. It could be through structural areas, living areas where patients might be found. It could be through HVAC systems, depending on the type of building we're talking about here. So that fire, if you don't give it a path, is going to try and find that path. A lot of time, you know, when it when it busts out a window, that's the fire releasing. That's from the pressure inside that has actually caused that blow, that blast to blow. Now that pressure can be released through that window. So the PPA, so our positive pressure ventilation fans, they have to overcome the pressure that's being produced by that fire. <clears throat> but our fans are pretty amazing. They can move upwards of fifteen thousand. That's right, fifteen thousand cubic feet per minute of air. That can, over, that can overcome a great deal of pressure from it that, that's occurring on the inside. Another thing to understand is when we talked about penciling, penciling from the exterior, if we are able to, to, to pencil effectively from the exterior, um, what you're doing is you're decreasing the heat uh, that's being released, and, and, that, and that decrease in heat is actually going to result in a lower pressure. You're lowering the pressure by cooling that, that hot, those hot smoking gases. Then when we go to put our fan up and when we go to, probably to, to do positive pressure ventilation, what's going to happen is that fan's going to have a better chance and is going to be far more effective than it would be if we were just to put the fan at the door and hope for the best. So cooling from the exterior does a lot of things that are very positive with fire. Talk about our last heat concept right now horizontal ver versus vertical ventilation. I talk about this because this is part of the exterior operations component, but uh, the first thing we need to be very clear on is we don't do vertical ventilation in the CSRD, okay? But understanding the two different types and what, what, we, what we talk about when we say horizontal versus vertical. So horizontal ver ventilation, it's any technique that's gonna remove heat, smoke, and gases from the structure using horizontal openings. That could be doors, windows, other openings in the wall if you have them. So, and that, so basically it's just going straight across. As, so in vertical ventilation, it's where we have ventilation at a point above the fire through possibly through an existing uh, or opening, usually through a created opening that we cut, um, that channels the contaminated atmosphere vertically straight up and out into the air, uh, into the atmosphere outside. So in that, if, so for vertical ventilation, we're looking at the cut openings where we use a chainsaw, uh, that would be skylights, uh, roof vents, um, roof doors, things like that. Um, we do not perform vertical ventilation in the CSRD as per our standard operating guidelines. Very, very dangerous to place firefighters on a roof above a burning fire. Uh, it's one of the most dangerous things you could do. Um, fire goes up. The, those uh, <laughs> roofs aren't, to even, aren't, aren't to always uh, able to support the load to begin with. And uh, new building materials also make failure happen much quicker than it did in the past. There have been many fatalities as a result of vertical ventilation and by placing firefighters onto roofs. And horizontal ventilation has been proven to be as effective as vertical ventilation in removing that hot smoking gases from the structure. So now we need to start thinking about if we're going to ventilate, what, are, what, what kind of things do we need to start taking into consideration? And there's a number of considerations that come into play as an incident commander who's making the decision of how they want to ventilate. There are a number of things we need to understand. The first thing we need to think about is our number one priority, the risk to us firefighters and the risk to the occupants inside of the building. That timely and effective ventilation is going to assist in our search and rescue operations. It does provide fresh air and it removes hot smoking gases from the building, it provides better visibility for our searches. Um, but poor visibility can decrease the chance of survivability by growing the fire and forcing it towards occupants. So if we don't do it right, and if we, if we, we could end up actually pushing that fire into areas of the structure it wasn't before, and those areas may be the places where our occupants have chosen to seek shelter and seek cover. Um, so 
the with occupants i mean there are a number of life hazards generally generally the there's not as many life hazards if they're awake when it happens but as we know a number of our fires happen at night when people are asleep if occupants are asleep uh, when the fire developed and are still in the building the possibilities are that they may have been they are already may be overcome by the smoke fire and gases so we need to look at that building and say is this survivable if there is somebody inside of it is it even is there still a chance that they're even alive these are hard questions to ask, but these are questions we need to uh, we need to ask because we're not going to be putting ourselves in certain in, in risk either if if uh, if there's no survivable life to save. Right? Um, we also have a we also have to understand people wake up, they're going to be groggy. So there's a chance they became lost in the structure on their way out. You can live there for many years, but just the disorienting nature of waking up and your entire house is full of smoke it's very disorienting. So they could uh, end up uh, being lost somewhere. Um, and they may be alive and in rooms somewhere taking refuge because, it, you know, because the doors were closed and they were able to close those doors and keep themselves safe, but they aren't able to get themselves out. Um, with firefighters, some of the hazards from uh, the accumulation of smoke and fire gases me, uh, will cause uh, visual impairment, meaning we can't see, right? Uh, dense smoke, you know, we do a lot of training uh, and, and uh, I'm sure a number of you have done these, you know, search drills. You take your balaclava and put it over your head so you can't see. Um, that's the training. We don't want to be in those situations if we can avoid it though. Um, the accumulation of smoke also makes it less oxygen, presence of toxic gases, flammable gases, and the possibility for that rapid fire development. So again, we have to think about do we have occupants and are we, you know, what about our firefighters? How do we keep them safe? Are we putting them into the building? And will my actions make it safer or less safe for them when we put them in there? Touched a bit on building construction already. So with single family residential construction, it's changed so much over time. I, I talked a little bit about the way, if you look on that picture on the screen, you look at, you know, that, that you have that one long hallway uh, down and you've got all these different rooms that are compartmentalized, more compartmentalization. Now with these new open floor plans, uh, you end up having much bigger, wide cavernous areas within residential structures. Um, structure size has also increased over 150% since 1973. Uh, the lot sizes are getting smaller, so they're going down, they've gone down by 25%. So we've got a, a smaller area to work, work on and a much bigger uh, structure to deal with. Um, and what that does, by decreasing the size of the lot, uh, it reduces our access uh, in some ways, and it can also increase the, the potential for exposure risks, meaning, uh, you know, the, the adjacent houses and other things that are close by on the property, maybe that propane tank is, is a bit closer than it would have been in the past, uh, or other flammable, uh, flammable things in the yard. So understanding that part of building construction is important. Um, residential interior layouts of constru and, and construction materials have also changed. Um, older, structure, older structures are constructed using smaller compartments, like you can see on the picture there. Um, windows that can be opened for ventilation where oh, sometimes now we're not getting that. Um, and then you also get though the empty wall cavities uh, which, which provide air pockets and places for fire to travel. Now the older houses when they before they had fire breaks you got what you call balloon frame and that fire can get in behind the wall and it can travel anywhere. So understanding that are we at an older house or are we, are we at one you know do we have building inspections in our area. Um, and knowing what kind of you know when the approximate ages of when the houses were built will give you a better idea of what we might be expecting with fire travel within the walls there. With the modern single family structures we're looking at those open floor plans we're looking at much higher vaulted ceilings um, they're made with lightweight uh, manufactured structure components so you know again that we did a we do we have a whole uh, section of building construction that we have to understand so many of you may have already heard all of this but the sealed windows um, you know windows that, that do not function and do not open wall cavities filled with synthetic insulation. Um, so, but that synthetic ins insulation often actually acts as a bit of a barrier as well. And there's also fire breaks inside of it. But those new lightweight building construction, uh, building components, um, they, they tend to be a big hassle for us. Um, and then there's the construction materials we also have to consider. So not only construction materials, but the, the materials that uh, they go to build uh, the, the components and what's actually inside of those rooms. So the couches are now made um, with uh, petro petrochemicals, um, synthetic materials, light, you know, and then there's light composite wood components that are glued together. Those as well will add to heat and add to the smoke that's inside that building. 
again, building structure, fire behavior. We have, a, this is an entire component on that and understanding the fire behavior and what we're looking at when we get there will also give us an indication on what, whether we vent, what, whether or not we should vent and you know, what could possibly happen when we vent. So when we look at the smoke, our observations can help us obtain a clear picture of what's happening inside. And that comes from reading smoke. Uh, for those of you who've taken some officer courses or some team leader courses, you may have already learned a bit of how to read smoke. And there's some great uh, material out there. I'm telling you, it only comes with practice. And even with practice, you'll never be an expert because smoke is a dynamic thing that can change. Uh, but it can certainly give you some good, uh, some good clues as to what's happening inside that building. Uh, we look at things like the volume. Uh, so the, the volume of the smoke discharge, the location, where is it coming out of? That can give us an idea on seat of the fire. The smoke color the density, the pressure, all of these are indicators for what's on fire, how much of it is on fire, how much air is getting in there as well. And then the movement of that smoke. If you look at the picture on the top, you can see the windward side on the right of this picture and the leeward side on the left of the picture. So you can understand where it's going. And, and uh, again, we want to try and work with that natural ventilation if we can because you don't want it but at sometimes you may have to overcome that and our fans like i said 15,000 cubic feet for, per minute they're up to the task in most cases it would take uh, quite a bit of wind for for it to overpower our fan um other fire behavior indicators the uh, the movement of air the airflow the movement of that air towards burning fuel and the movement of the smoke out of the compartment right we want to look at the velocity the turbulence how fast is it coming out how you know how is it boiling when it comes out is it getting wispy um, the direction it's traveling um, and then the movement on the neutral plane you can see in a lot of areas where you maybe only have a window broken there'll be there'll be bidirectional flow already happening in the in, in the structure when you pull up um, and when you start seeing where that neutral plane is, how high, how low, how much is coming out of the structure as opposed to coming in, it also gives you an idea on the airflow inside of that building and whether there may be other vents that you need to find. So the airflow is, is typically caused by the pressure differentials, right? In, uh, so the, it's at uh, higher pressure, trying to seek out that lower pressure to equalize. The differences in density between hot smoke and the cooler air is another thing. Uh, that causes airflow. So hot smoke, uh, and hot and cool, that's going to actually create its own airflow. Um, as we've seen, you can see that with fire behavior on large wildfires, they create their own weather systems. There's so much heat that, that's kicked off from those. Um, and the airflow will always follow flow paths, whatever that flow path is, right? Maybe it'll, <clears throat> so the parts of a flow path that we need to understand again is the inlet. So that's where the air is going to enter and the outlet, that's the exhaust vent. That's where the smoke is gonna come out. So other things with the fire behavior, visual indicators of heat, right? So we wanna, if we're seeing, how much heat are we seeing? Is there blistering on the paint, bubbling on the roof tar? Uh, is there crazed glass? Is, so the, you can actually see when the glass gets overheated and, and it starts to crack. Um, a thermal imager or an infrared sensor, a lot of times scanning that can give you an idea on the heat inside. It also can help you determine the pressure of the increased temperatures through the, if you just use touch, and I'm not talking about taking your glove off and going against, it's peeling your glove back and using the back of your hand uh, to, to see. And if you're at a distance, a lot of times, you know, as an, I, I know uh, as a person who now often stands further back from the fires, I'm still feeling the heat on some of our bigger fires. Uh, and, and that gives me a good indicator of what, you know, of what we're dealing with and, uh, and, and how much we're going to have to get out of this building. So and then, again, fire behavior, flame. We need to look at that. Is it visible? Is it coming out of certain areas? But you see, this is the last one I'm talking about. So often as firefighters, our first instinct is, I mean, you come to a fire, the first thing you're going to see is that flame. That is not always the best indicator. So looking at these other indicators, like the smoke, the heat, uh, they're definitely going to give you a better sense of what's going on as well but than just looking at the flame on its own. So... If it's visible though, that flame can provide a, an indication of the size and location of the fire. Um, it can, it can, uh, if it's visible outside the visible outside the structure, it allows uh, it allows us to assess what basically what kind of fire behavior we may be dealing with before we even have to go inside to look at that fire behavior. All right, location and extent of the fire is another consideration we have to have. Where is it? What's happening? And and how 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 far has it gone at this point in time? Right. So we need to we need to quickly determine that when we when we roll up on scene, uh, where is this fire exactly? Because as I said before, when we're looking at making an exhaust point for ventilation activities, we, we need to have that as close to the seat of the fire as possible. 
uh, we don't want to be putting that um, you know on the other side of the building you're going to travel that smoke you're going to push that smoke through the structure all the way to the other uh, to the other exit <clears throat> so by if we and if we put roll up on a scene and we start creating you know creating openings by breaking glass um, you're basically now going to spread that fire into uninvolved areas uh, you've now made it into a free burn. It's got all the air it wants. It's only going to stop when it becomes fuel in it. Uh, the flame can also tell us the severity and extent of the fire, depending on the factors. It can sometimes tell us the type of fuel, depending, you know, it, depending on the color of that flame, the amount of time that it's been burning. Uh, are we in, you know, are we in the incipient stage? Unlikely if we've got those out. So we've now got a sense that we're getting into the fully developed stage when we've got fire actually self-venting out of buildings. Um, do we have fire system? Have fire systems been activated? You know, and, and has it been confined in any way by just the building construction and the way you know people close doors on their ways out on their way out? So another consideration is we need to think about is what is our location for ventilation. So before selecting a place, we want to gather as much information about the fire, the building, and the occupancy, and we do that through a 360 size up. The fire that's when you see your your fire chief taking a leisurely stroll around the building and looking at all the and looking at all four sides of that building before coming up with their action plan on how they're going to address this because we might see something from the front and think that we know what's going on but until you've actually looked around 360 you do not know everything that's going on so factors that are going to have a bearing on where we choose to ventilate uh, possible location of occupants. Where are the bedrooms at? You know, have you talked to a homeowner during your 360 and your size up? Have they given you any information about maybe where grandma is right now? Um, the availability of uh, if there's any existing openings in the building. Uh, by looking at where, where is the location of the fire, that's going to definitely impact our, our where we're going to be uh, ventilating from <clears throat> and to. Um, what is our desired flow path? Where do we want the air to travel within that building? What type of building construction? What's the wind direction? Um, how far has this fire gone? And what do we think the effect that the ventilation is going to have on this fire? Is it going to make it bigger? Is it going to, is it going to keep it into a nice little tight corner? Is it already basically, I mean, we're going to write that room off and we're just going <clears> to, <throat> but we're going to be able to contain it to that room by using ventilation. So again, we need to look at, uh, that's going to depend on all of these factors. Um, are our crews ready? So if we're going to start ventilating, what is our purpose for this? Is it going to be, are we going to be keeping it as an exterior attack? Or are we getting crews geared up to do an interior attack on this fire? And are they ready to do that attack? Um, and then what about the exposure? You know, we're, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then we want to, but we want to make sure as well that there is some kind of, there is a means of egress uh, and we want to protect that means of egress if we put firefighters in. So weather conditions. Any building opening is going to allow the, atm the atmosphere to affect what's happening inside of that building. Um, a lot of our buildings now are buttoned up really tight. There is not a lot of airflow. There's not a lot of transition of air. Uh, the older buildings, you can get, you know, you, there, there's air traveling in and out of there from little tiny openings all over the place. Nowadays, uh, they're pretty much airtight. Uh, windows are being constructed better. There's less areas for, the, for, for air to move. Um, but fire will find its own ways and it will make its own openings if it needs to. So some of the conditions, the weather, condi weather conditions that are going to affect ventilation, the temperature um, is going to have a, is going to play a role in it. The atmospheric pressure. So is it, you know, are we in an area of low pressure or high pressure at that time? Precipitation, um, you know, rain, uh, that's one of our best friends at fires, right? Where it can help us protect exposures without having to do anything. Um, relative humidity, uh, so again, uh, drier climates, the fire will spread faster, more humidity, you've got more, uh, more water, there's more moisture in the air, uh, the fire is going to be, it's going to help contain the fire better. And then the wind, how, how strong is it? Um, you know, where's the direction that it's going? Or what's the, where's the prevailing winds coming from? Um, so again, that wind, that's the most important influence that we can think about as well. So I touched on it briefly, exposures, right? Exposures are, you know, exposures are anything very, you know, adjacent to uh, a building on fire. Uh, it could be part of the building on fire that's not yet involved in that building, uh, like this little porchway here that's attached to the structure, but it's still considered an exposure. Um, so these are basically building, uh, buningss, occupants, contents, un uninvolved rooms or portions of rooms. <clears throat> so when we're removing the hot smoking gases, uh, from the building by using ventilation, uh, it has to go somewhere. It's going to come out and it's going to come out through your exit. 
so we need to under so we need to look at that. I didn't see is this a proper place that we want it to be coming out now. The picture that we have above there, I don't know that I would have chosen that necessarily as the place, but it depends on their options. They may not have had any other options if they're trying to keep it close to the, uh, if they're trying to keep it close to the seat of the fire. Um, basically, so what we want to do is we want to protect those exposures and we want to, if we can make a choice to avoid those exposures, that's always for the best. So take those into account, understand that hot smoking gases will be leaving the building from that area. Uh, if we can avoid that hot smoking gas is coming into contact with the, uh, you know, with the exposures, we've, we've limited the ability for that fire to spread into those exposures as well. All right, and the last consideration I want to talk about right now as well is staffing and available resources. So ventilation, I mean, it's, it requires personnel and it requires resources. Uh, the type of ventilation you're going to use will impact that, um, how, you know, and, uh, so we, there's different techniques we can do to try and limit the amount of personnel that are needed depending on what your resources are at the time. Staffing requirements could range from two firefighters to multiple companies depending on what you're trying to accomplish. And we'll get into that a little bit as we go on as well. Small structure, the ventilation might only require two firefighters. One to open the door, one to open the, the, one to open the entryway, one to open the exit, um, and then just allowing the smoke, uh, allow it to exit. So, a lot of times we can only, you know, positive pressure ventilation can be accomplished with one. There's also other types of ventilation that we'll talk about soon. And we'll talk about staffing on those as well. Uh, sometimes you're going to need other resources. Sometimes, depending on whether you've got an appropriate place for the vent to enter, the vent to exit, um, are we going to need forcible entry tools to open doors, to take bars off of windows? Do we need power saws to increase the openings that we're using? Um, we've got the fans and blowers we're going to be using, smoke ejectors, um, electrical power cords, generators, things like that. So all of these take people to operate them. So the, depending on the technique you're using and the size of the building you're dealing with and the extent of the fire, it's going to impact your, the, the amount of resources that it's going to take to do what you want to do. <clears throat> the other thing to keep in the, the the other thing to keep in mind is uh, the amount of the size of ventilation equi equipment increases and the amount of in uh, equipment that we have increases, the space on the apparatus to store that equipment is going to start getting fairly limited. So we, don't, we can't typically take everything that we'd like to have all the time. All right, now we're moving on to the types of the different types of ventilation. And we've got four main types that I'd like to talk about today. That's natural, hydraulic, negative pressure, and positive pressure. So we'll talk about natural ventilation first. Natural ventilation, very straightforward. Just, it depends on the convection currents, wind, other natural air movements. So um, it takes advantage of the natural airflow. What's how, and, and this is a, a form of ventilation. Um, it's used typically when air, and, and it can actually be part of your uh, incident action plan is to ventilate using natural ventilation, depending on the situation. Um, Typically, it will have. It, you're going to use it when the air currents are adequate to move the contaminated atmosphere out of the building, and when ventilation is needed very quickly. So we know we maybe we have somebody in there. We don't have time to even set up the fan. But if we open the door here on the windward side, and then we open a window on the leeward side, we're actually going to be able to effectively remove some of the smoke and gases and start the process without even having the fan set up. The procedure for doing that, uh, for actually calling for natural ventilation, is 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 a job that's that's always going to be directed by the incident commander. Every single ventilation technique we talk about here, again, coordinated activities. So you're going to want to create the exit point first by opening a window or a door on the leeward side of the structure, and then you're going to be opening on the windward side of the structure. So always the leeward first. You don't want to be opening it up and putting air into a building without having a place for it to go. It will find a place to go. And, it, and that place that it's going to find to go is going to make your life and your job that much more difficult because now it's in the walls, now it's in the attic spaces, crawl spaces, and other areas. Maybe it's pushed into the basement. So we always open in the, for natural ventilation. We're going to open the exit first. So some of the advantages of natural ventilation, you don't need any special equipment. If it's windy outside, you've got everything you need for natural ventilation. You need a pike pole or some, maybe some forcible entry tools if you need to, if you need to force a door. Uh, and far less personnel is required to do this technique. I mean, one person can go open the exit, come back around, open the enter, and, uh, and there you go, good to go. 
disadvantages, pretty straightforward as well. The, 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 this system is uncontrolled. Uh, so the wind speed changes. Wind direction can change unexpectedly. Typically, it's less air movement than you're going to have uh, if you were using any other kind of mechanical ventilation, that's negative pressure, positive pressure, or even hydraulic ventilation. They all have far more air movement in most situations than you're going to get with natural ventilation. So just remember, natural ventilation is the least controlled and least effective form of ventilation of the ones we're going to talk about today. Hydraulic ventilation. This is the fun one we get to do when we go to uh, to the burn building at the training center. For those of you who've done interior live fire, even if even exterior live fire, when we do the uh, when we do the cold start, we show you how to do uh, hydraulic ventilation, and and uh, we show you the effects at, of being inside there in a hot fire room. Start uh, hydraulically venting the, uh, the the burn can there, and you notice very quickly how much how 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 it cools down, cools the space. You've got, you feel much more comfortable very quickly. You can see much better very quickly. It really is, it's a very effective procedure. Um, so what hydraulic ventilation is, is just using a fog pattern from the nozzle to draw smoke out of a building through a window. That's, that's what it is. It's, uh, it's used to clear a room, sometimes a building, depending on how big it is, but of yeah, that smoke, hot, uh, heat and gases, at, once the fire is controlled. So after we've gone in, we've, we've knocked that fire down, maybe it's during the overhaul stages, you want a little bit vis uh, better visibility, maybe it's still hot in there, it's still kicking off some heat, maybe we want to hydraulic ventilate and we're gonna end up you know, put, uh, replacing that heat and that smoke and the gases that are in there with fresh, clean air from the outside. So the procedure for this one, again, we need to communicate coordinated activity. So we communicate with incident command for permission to hydraulically vent. Why are we going to communicate? You see that picture on the right hand side there. Uh, if somebody was standing on that ladder, they'd be having a bad day. We want to communicate with incident command. And if somebody calls and says, I want to, I, I would like to hydraulic vent out of the second story Charlie window. That incident commander, if they can't see the second story Charlie window, is going to go and they're going to take a look. They're going to make sure that there's no one standing near that window so that they're going to be hit in the face by a fog stream coming out. Uh, so that communication is, is key and it's, and it's also key to, for a command to take a look and make sure that, uh, that it is clear to do that. So what we're going to want to do, as you can see in the picture there, we're going to want to stand at least two feet back from the opening. We're going to start by spraying a straight stream through the window opening and gradually dialing it over, right, until it, and switching to a fog stream until it covers, let's call it 85 to 90 percent of the window opening. Um, why not 100 percent? Because it, it actually can cause turbulence and can force smoke back in if we end up hitting the sides of the, bu of the building on its way out. It also can create a lot more uh, water damage inside the building. Uh, which, you know, our job is to try and prevent that damage, make the people's day a little bit better and start making things better for them. We're not there to try and trash it and add more water if, where it's not necessary. So the bigger the opening that you have as well for hydraulic ventilation, similar to others, is, you know, the more effective that's going to be. Advantages of hydraulic ventilation, clear smoke from a room quickly. Those of you who've been through it and have had a chance to, to participate in our live fire training, you've seen that very quickly. Uh, it, takes, it takes the smoke out of that room. Um, and it can be used as needed during long overhaul or secondary searches. You can, you, you can try it, you can do it, you can shut it down, you can try it, you can do it again later if you need a little bit more. So disadvantages, I touched on it briefly about the water damage. That's one disadvantage is that it can definitely increase water damage within a structure if it's not done correctly. Um, it can be a drain on available water supply. We're rural firefighters. We're working with a, a very finite quantity of, of water here in, in some cases, uh, and, and saving that water can be very important. Um, during freezing temperatures, we're going to be making more ice on the ground, so when we've got more slip fall hazards. Um, so the nozzle operator the, the nozzle operator also and the whoever is doing the, the hydraulic ventilation they've got to be inside of a of a building that was just on fire in that contaminated atmosphere as long as that operation is going on um, and then the operation also will have to stop if that nozzle team has to leave and that they could leave maybe their air supply is low now we have to go we have to stop hydraulic ventilation so that is so those are the things that the, that can definitely impair it and make uh, hydraulic ventilation a little less desirable 
Next one I want to talk about is negative pressure ventilation. Uh, but first, let me just say the next two I'm going to talk about are mechanical forms of ventilation. So with mechanical ventilation, what we're doing is we're ensuring we have more control of the airflow than with natural ventilation. Um, we're using equipment here that provides a constant steady amount of ventilation and airflow within a structure uh, that's quantifiable, that's typically doesn't change unless conditions change elsewhere. With negative pressure, we're talking like basically this is like the oldest type of ventilation. Back in the day, this was what they used to do. It's where they use smoke ejectors, and that's when that's what the the fan is in this photo. Is the, those are called smoke ejectors. Uh, they're used to expel or pull the smoke from a structure um, by by creating uh, an artificial airflow, or in some cases, they can enhance natural ventilation. So we've already got the uh, uh, a flow path inside because of the natural ventilation that's happening and the smoke ejector can just give it that little oomph it needs uh, to be even more effective. Uh, the, smoke, uh, the smoke, fire, gases, they're all drawn out of the structure uh, and fresh air is drawn into the structure by the fans. Um, typically nowadays when we look at smoke ejectors we're using those during the overhaul phase after the fire has already been knocked down. And the reason for that is that smoke ejectors easily can be damaged if superheated smoke or the fire is drawn, is drawn through them. So, that, so during the fire, that is very hot smoke coming out through there. Uh, and it can, it, it, can, uh, it can negatively impact the, the smoke ejectors. You can also see we need to, the way that they've done it, you know, some of the techniques to do it, we need to make sure that we're sealing off the rest of the void spaces around where we've hung that smoke ejector. It can take a little bit, it can take more time. So the procedure when we're looking to set it up is we just, we were looking to place it somewhere in a window, in a door, in a roof vent opening, somewhere like that. Um, we always want to also put this on the leeward side of the building. We don't want to be trying to fight the wind with the smoke ejector. Uh, and we want to properly seal around it like they did with this tarp here. They also have nowadays, now they've actually started creating um, different kinds of tarps that are, that are actually more snugly fit and, and uh, made to hang indoors um, uh, to do what that tarp is doing in this picture here. Um, so Again, we want, to be, we want to avoid opening windows or doors near the smoke ejector. You're going to reduce the efficiency of the ventilation. We, want to reduce, we, want, we don't want to have too many obstacles inside that are going to reduce the airflow. Any person standing inside is going to alter that flow path. Any, major, any big uh, for pieces of furniture uh, or something inside can also, or doors or things like that, they're certainly going to Im impact it. Now we get to the big one. The positive pressure ventilation. This is the one where we use our positive pressure fans, and we're actually uh, and we're actually increasing the pressure inside of a building uh, to try and direct the, the and direct where that hot smoke and gases is going to exit the building. So positive pressure ventilation is a technique using a high volume fan to create higher pressure inside the structure than there is on the outside. You remember that picture I showed you. Uh, a little while back where we had all the positive, you know, all the high pressure inside and the negative pressure outside. And we're actually increasing that higher pressure inside the building uh, and making it and directing that, uh, that high pressure into a, into a certain location so that it doesn't make its own path outside of the building. So the higher pressure, it's gonna force that smoke to travel through openings to the lower pressure area on the outside. But again, all of these techniques require coordination, discipline and a really sound tactical knowledge of what we're dealing with here with ventilation. So the openings with positive pressure ventilation we're looking at and we've got an entry opening so the inlet or a lot of times when we're talking about tactically we're talking about vent enter. That's the location where we're going to set up the fan. Uh, then we have the exhaust opening. Tactically that's called vent exit. Uh, that's the position where the hot smoke and gases are going to leave the building. Uh, that could be a window, it could be a doorway, uh, has to be close to the seat of the fire. Um, the heat, smoke, and gases will follow that flow path to the exit, spreading the fire if it's not. And the size of the exit should be between 75% and 200% the size of the entry opening. We, uh, it used to be the time when people thought it's smaller, I mean, because you know, you're increasing the pressure inside by pushing the fan and a smaller opening, kind of like putting a little hole in a balloon. 
the balloon now it now releases that air and it all pressure it's under great pressure going out from that one tiny little opening but what we what the science has shown and ul has done a, a, a ton of experiments on this is that you you want that bigger opening the fire is creating its own pressure we don't need to be pressurizing anymore all we're really doing is increasing it just a little bit so that it's going in a way that so that the pressure is being forced in a way that we want it to go as opposed to just any way it wants to go so by having that opening between you know between 75 percent and 200 percent of the size we know we're getting the most effective ventilation we're removing as much of the hot smoking gases as rapidly as possible from inside the building we're also giving it less of a chance to be in that goldilocks zone where it might reach its ignition point and cause you know a smoke explosion the smoke could ignite cause flashover or other types of, or other negative impacts on the firefighter So I think here I've got a bit of a video. Let's see if it works. Cannot play media. Okay, so that one's not gonna work. I'm gonna see if I can find, oh, there it is. Okay, so what you see here is they started ventilating. They didn't have a hose line set up. We achieved possession of this house that has to be demolished and we decided to make a training session out of this house before it gets demolished. So what we've done, we have a, a technique that Southfield has been using to fight fires for the last 18 years. And we wanted to introduce it to other departments in the area, uh, teach them how we do it and see if it is a benefit to them. It's called positive pressure attack. So we've invited uh, about 10 other fire departments to come here and observe, participate. Some of them are using positive pressure attack. We got the input from them. pretty much like uh, blowing up a balloon. You positively pressure a balloon, and if you were to uh, somehow open the other end, everything's gonna push out the other end. What we did is where the front door is, we put a fan, we pressurized this house, we created an opening for the fire to come out. We pushed it through under high pressure. We went in standing up instead of crawling underneath heat and smoke and flames. And we put the fire out very quickly. We had thermal imaging cameras in there. So uh, the temperature of the ceiling was around 1,000 degrees, 900 degrees. Um, rapid fire development. Uh, we used pallets, uh, newspaper, and some hay to, to generate the fire. Uh, high smoke generation. Smoke went from about three feet from the ceiling all the way to the uh, ground. Um, you know, we see that we can actually see that thermal layering, high heat, medium high heat, lower heat towards the floor. Um, then we start with the fan, lower heat towards the floor. Um, then we start with the fan, the positive pressure uh, ventilation. Um, that allows us to inject fresh air, create a more tenable environment for our firefighters. Like we That allows us to inject fresh air, create a more tenable environment for our firefighters, like we tell the public to crawl into the uh, building, um, to see where they're going a little bit better and put water on the fire that much faster. Uh, this is uh, the first time we've done one of these with Southfield, which is our immediate neighbor to the east. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get the crews together, um, kind of get to know each other, know each other's operations. Um, Top-notch job done by Southfield. We appreciate the opportunity to come over and do this. All right, now did you hear they use the term positive pressure attack? So we'll talk a little bit about this term. Just understand that basically it simply means using a PPV fan to perform a fire attack, uh, going in with the fan at your back. Um, so I, I've had a real hard time finding any videos that actually show a proper procedure for ventilation. Um, a lot of these videos made in the United States, you're going to find them going around and in some cases, you know, what they do is the officer going around is actually going to create the vent exit as they're doing their 360. They're just going to go around, you know, oh, this is where it's going to be, smash it open. Whenever they get the fan set up, they get the fan set up. So again, not coordinated. 
Um, we see it a lot of times where they where they don't do it properly and they actually put, uh, you know, they don't have a proper cone on the door. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the proper techniques for that as well. But um, it's it, you got to be very careful when you're looking out there online and when, especially, you know, at any firefighting uh, training that you look at on YouTube or other places, um, doesn't it, just because they, they made a video about it doesn't make it right. And that's the one thing I found, not only with the, the videos out there, but even with the training material available on, on ventilation, it seems like they're not using the science that's, that's behind it. So be very careful when, when looking at those things. Um, the one thing I did want to point out, though, is that when they made the, when they made the exit point for ventilation there, what you saw was I mean, the, the firefighter there, you used the pike pole, they opened it up. It was fairly coordinated. So it's, about, it's one of the better videos I've seen because the, you saw the, the exit was made and then you could hear the fan firing up very quickly after that. Uh, that was good. What wasn't so good was the fact that they didn't have a hose line. Again, they're using an acquired structure, so there was training, and there might have been a little bit of a, a plan to that, and this could have been by design, but having a hose line there, you saw how quickly that hot smoke and gas is exiting that, uh, out that window. They ignited very quickly. Um, having that hose line, having a team on standby, ready to pencil if necessary, ready to protect soffit areas on the exterior of the building, um, that's, that's, a, that's another one of the keys we've got to keep in mind. So, like I said, it's hard to find one with good procedure on it. So all I can do right now is really talk to you about the procedure because, again, this has to be a coordinated activity. I haven't found a lot of good ones out there that show you how uh, how to do it. So we're not going to we're not going to uh, ventilate unless we're instructed to by IC. When firefighters are asked to uh, asked to move the fan to the building that's showing smoke, the firefighters need to have on PPE and SCBA. If you're bringing a fan up to the building and its smoke is going to be coming out that door, put on your PPE and SCBA. If you're the one who's going to be making the opening uh, at the vent exit, put on your PPE and SCBA. You could find yourself in very different conditions very quickly as soon as you make that exit. So make sure you're in your full PPE and SCBA. So we need a minimum of two firefighters if we're looking at doing, uh, P, uh, if we're doing a uh, positive pressure ventilation. Uh, one on the vent enter, one on the vent exit. If you have a third, that's fantastic. We can have a team leader, somebody to actually help with the coordination of it, right? Um, if you only have two firefighters uh, on the vent team, then the vent exit person is going to be the team leader, all right? They're the ones who, can, who are going to be able to say, okay, ready, yeah, go. Uh, they're also the ones who should have the radio because they're going to have to radio back to incident command and tell them that they have ventilation established and that ventilation is effective. Um, so having that radio, uh, they're the ones who can see the smoke. They're the ones who can tell whether it's, uh, you know, how it's working. Uh, so that's why we use vent exit as the team leader. And the team leader is the one that coordinates all the vent activities. They're the ones that do it and make sure that everything happens at the right time. So again, our procedure, we're going to place the fan at the opening on a normal three foot wide door. We're looking at about four to six feet from the, uh, fr from the opening of the door. Uh, I had that on a slide a couple, a couple slides ago. Uh, we're going to want to start the fan. This is before we open the door. We want to start the fan. We want to make the, we're going to check and make sure that the cone of air that we're producing covers the entire opening. You can see on the picture on the left here, that cone of air covers that entire opening. There are a lot of other techniques out there that show you that no, you want to you have a, an opening at the top that's not covered by the cone of air. They call that a diagnostic opening. Um, they say, oh, this is how we read what's happening inside the building by looking at the smoke coming out from there. Now we can see because you're, what they're doing is they're creating this bilateral flow, which is now forcing hot smoking gases over anybody going making entry into that structure. And it's forcing the hot smoking gases in other places of the building uh, and, and back away from the fire all the way down, if it's a long hallway, it's, it's burning everything on the way back. So that diagnostic opening is not, is not correct. Uh, it's dangerous, it's the wrong technique. Uh, we wanna have that cone fully on the door. So we started the fan, door still closed, started the fan, check to see that the cone of air produced covers the entire opening. We're then gonna throttle down and we're gonna wait until we're told. At the signal from the team leader, you're gonna simultaneously open the vent enter and the vent exit, and you're going to throttle up the fan. If one is gonna be open slightly early, same as, with, uh, same as with natural, we're looking at the vent exit being opened slightly early. Same reason as the natural. If we open the vent enter early in the inlet early, you're gonna be pushing that smoke, that hot smoking gases, and it's going to be looking for its own way out of the building. And, the, and those ways are gonna increase the fire spread, okay? 
We're going to want to communicate with your team leader and to incident command to, know, to let them know we have effective ventilation. So I mentioned the effective ventilation. Uh, that means that, this is, that the vent fan is doing what we wanted it to do. If we don't have effective ventilation, some of the reasons could be we have doors or barriers inside the building we're unaware of. We don't know the building layout and there, there's something in there that's, that's causing it to, to, to not work. Um, there may be another outlet somewhere else already open that we, if we can cover, we're going to try to cover. Okay. So some of the advantages that we need to think about with positive pressure ventilation, um, it can be set up very quickly with only a couple of firefighters. Firefighters don't have to enter into the atmosphere, into the hazardous atmosphere to make it work like they would with hydraulic ventilation. Um, it's quick, efficient, helps easily confine the fire, it increases our safety, uh, and it doesn't require much cleaning and maintenance. Those fans are very simple to maintain. We just, you know, we, we, we do a little bit of cleaning on them and, and make sure that uh, they're still in good working order, keep them filled with gas and oil, and they should keep working for us. There are electric fans out there as well. Some of the disadvantages of, of PPV, and we have to think about these as well, right? If we don't do it correctly, we are going to increase the fire spread. Um, another uh, downside, and some of you may think it's you know a real big problem, um, but it's uh, they're very noisy. This is one of the loudest noises you're going to have on a fire scene is when you have a PPV fan op operating on that scene. Uh, so we've got to think about our hearing. We don't want to stand right next to the fan. Incident commanders are going to have to find other places and team leaders are going to have to find other places to stand if they're going to be giving radio communications. Um, so, but that noise actually can become a, a real problem on fire scenes at times. Uh, it may increase carbon monoxide levels, uh, certainly around the fan from, uh, from the fan exhaust. Um, the hot motors, they could be unsafe because in the flammable, um, if there are flammable or combustible vapors present. And some fans won't start if it won't start or they can turn off if they're tipped, uh, tipped down while getting it out of the apparatus, you might, uh, you might end up flooding it. Um, they could, they need to be maintained and that you have to have fuel in them. What, you know, hopefully you'll never come across the situation where you've pulled the fan off the truck only to find that it needs to be gassed before you can start it up. That's something that's, uh, that's important and needs to be done on duty crew. We've got another video here to show you. Uh, one of the things that's happened in the United States is that people have seen videos and read a couple of articles and go to use it. And if positive pressure ventilation turns out wrong, it's because generally they used it wrong. Here, the crew failed to make an escape route at the rear of the building for the smoke and flames. When they start the fan, it simply blows the burning smoke straight back into their faces. So you saw how that, what happens in a situation there where they've opened it, they've, they've turned on the fan, they've, made, they've opened the entry, but they don't have an exit. That increased the fire de de growth and development very rapidly, and, it caught, and, and, a whole, and a ball of fire was basically coming back at that, uh, out, that, out that door that they just opened. You're giving it all the oxygen it needs, you're giving it a, exactly what it wanted, and now, you, now you've got a bigger problem to deal with, and, hopefully, and, and it could potentially end up injuring firefighters. That was a pretty big ball of fire coming out that front door. Try one more time. Now what we've got in this video is we've got firefighters entering a building. And so they're going in. And you, and you notice here, we don't have a vent fan set up at this point in time. 
you can hear the apparatus and you can hear all sorts of other things, but that's no, but there's no vent fan there right now. Now we've got teams on the interior. So now who knows what happened? Teams maybe teams are inside though, and uh, you may be like, "Oh, it's really smoky in here. Really hard to see what's going on." Somebody's going to get the brilliant idea that, yeah, we should be ventilating. Oh, now we're going to bring the fan. All right, let's get this thing fired up. We got the door open. Why not? So I'm using this video to demonstrate why we make sure we have ventilation in place before the team goes in. And it's not something that we do with teams in the building. Uh, that intro, Because there are unexpected things that can happen. In this situation, I don't know if it was coordinated. I don't know if they had somebody on the exit. Sure as heck didn't look like it to me. It looked more like they had somebody just decide, okay, well, we'll start ventilating. We're pretty sure there's something open back there already. Or the smoke is coming out of places, so it'll still come out of places. It'll just come out faster. What they've actually done is increased a huge amount of oxygen into that into that building envelope and that fire and that, the smoke then reached its perfect ignition temperature and uh, and, uh, and uh, the quantity of smoke in there was perfect for it. So it wasn't too rich, wasn't too lean. It ended up igniting and creating a flashover uh, effect and the firefighters in there, um, I believe they survived that situation, but there were a few firefighters very badly burned by that situation, by, by, uh, by that flashover and that was a training. Uh, a training uh, house that they had there that they were using it on. So the thing to take out of that video is fan is in place before teams make entry. You do not put it into place after that team has gone into the building because we want to make sure it's effective and if we end it, it you're, you are, you know, as much as we might know about it and as much as we might think we have everything under control, things can go wrong. All right. The one thing that tends to happen here as well when we start talking about uh, ventilation is, is there's all these different terminologies. For those of you who've taken a, a course with Wayne and Randy, Randy has some very colorful language uh, at times. Um, great guys know so much about ventilation. Um, they hate all of the different terminology. To, to them, it's, you know, just for ease, we should, we should call it positive pressure ventilation. And I'm good with that. If you know, calling it PPV is fine, but I think you should understand the, the terms as well, because there are different terms that we need to under that we need to use, uh, or that you're going to hear at times. And understanding what they mean uh, can help us, uh, you know, better choose what tactics we're going to be using. So the first one I want to talk to you about: positive pressure ventilation, using the PPV fan to ventilate smoke from the building. Okay. So again, the, with, the P, with the positive pressure ventilation, it's just, it can be used to control fire spread, prevent property damage during an exterior attack or overhaul operations. So we're ventilating, that's what PPV is. We use this term and you heard this term come up at one point in time, positive pressure attack. Very straightforward, positive pressure attack is using the PPV fan to conduct, conduct a coordinated fire attack. We're going in with a fan at our backs. So the, the building is being ventilated and we are now going in and doing it. Um, PPA 
uh, original, it has some negative connotations to it. And that's why uh, a lot of times you'll get Randy or Wayne really worked up if you start using the terminology PPA. Uh, the reason why is because the original uh, concept of PPA was actually done in a book, which I actually have right here, which is Positive Pressure Attack. It's by some guys, Chris Garcia, Reinhard Kaufman, and Ray Shevel. Now, Chris Garcia is actually somebody that uh, Wayne and Randy have met over time at the UL uh, when they were doing some testing. But what they did with Positive Pressure Attack was they did that diagnostic opening. The cone of air did not cover the entire door. They were using, uh, they, they only covered the bottom part of the door, and then there was still the top part where, where the smoke was coming out of. Um, and like I'd mentioned before, that is a very dangerous tactic. Now, if we, use, if we talk about PPA as being just a regular, using the full cone on the door and doing a coordinated fire attack, that's fine. Uh, having a diagnostic opening, not fine. And then another thing you might hear at some point is, positive pressure pressurization. And what positive pressure pressurization is, is it's actually a, a way of preventing fire from entering structures that are not currently involved in the fire. Um, so using fans as a defense mechanism. Uh, the fan is actually placed at the door of a house that we're trying to prevent fire to, from extending into. So this is maybe the neighbor's house, if it's a row of townhouses, and you're actually placing fans on the door of the adjacent houses, increasing the pressure. You're not um, opening a window or creating an outlet. There's no vent exit. You are just pressurizing. So by pressurizing the building, again, the fire is going to look for areas of lower pressure to go to. If you've increased the pressure in these houses, you've decreased the chance of that fire spreading to those houses. And I took some time to do a nice little art page here as well to kind of show you how that works. We've got the fire in the central unit here. That fire is creating a high pressure inside the house that's on fire. The way we create a higher pressure in the houses adjacent to it is by kicking two PPV fans there and not decrease and, and not open the window. We're now increasing the pressure there. The fire tries to move over to the to the house on the right. It's it's going to be pushed back by the pressure and find another way. House tries a tries to go to the house on the left or the the townhouse on the left. If they're actually connected by a wall, this is incredibly effective too. Uh, or if they have common ventways like townhouses, this is an amazing technique to prevent fire from traveling to areas where we don't have or where we don't currently have fire. Um, many, you know, those two little things with the X's on them, that's my fans. Um, for those of you who, you know, uh, who've gone to the, who've gone to structure fires before, have, like most of us have one, have one PPV fan for our department, but we almost always call mutual aid help as well. And so having that mutual, have, calling mutual aid, every one of our fire departments has access to a PPV fan. Uh, by calling mutual aid, you'll bring more uh, fans at hand and you can do a technique like this to actually prevent the fire from spreading. It's an amazing technique. Just a couple more slides, folks. But uh, breaking glass, it's one, of the, it's one of the skills we need to know, right? Um, breaking glass might be necessary if a window can't be opened um, and the need for ventilation is urgent. We need to ventilate. Breaking glass is often the easiest way to do it. Uh, we need to communicate it. Everything in ventilation is coordinated and communicated. We need to use a tool to clear the glass. Um, we also need to look around. We need to make sure that nobody's going to be hit by falling glass. Um, very, very dangerous. This is plate glass. These are it's not typically tempered glass you're going to find on windows that go into nice little tiny beads. These are going to be large shards coming down. So we need to be very careful when we're doing this because we can get very injured. We need to be in full PPE. Now, when we're breaking glass, the area we want to strike is on the top one third of the window first. Uh, by hitting it at the top one third of the window, you're not you're making sure that you don't have a large unbroken pane uh, coming down on your arms or on your head as it's coming as it's traveling down. You want to break from the top and then clear and then use your tool to clear out around and clear all the remaining broken broken glass around there. And you need to communicate this first. I mean, first with a incident command needs to be aware of it. Your team leader, you need to communicate when it's done. And, uh, and you need to communicate with your team as well when you're breaking glass so that people are aware, they're able to put their visors down and keep themselves safe and they're in full PPE. Uh, we could also have to, at times, break glass from a ladder. To do that, we're going to want to position the ladder where we want it, make the tip of the ladder even with the window. You see how he's got it here in the, in the photo I've got. We're going to want to climb to a position where we're level with the window. Uh, and then we're going to want to do a leg lock. So those of you who've gone through ladders already, you know what a leg lock is. Those of you who haven't, you're in for a treat. 
uh, locking your la your leg on the ladder is it, it makes it incredibly very safe. Uh, it makes it very difficult for you to actually fall off of it. And you can see in the picture here that guy has leg lock in on that rung. Uh, his right leg is locked right in. And then we're going to use a hand tool to break the way to, to break the window or, and, and clear the glass. In this case, he's chosen an axe. Could be a small pike pole. Could be a halligan bar. Could be anything. Now, another technique that I don't have a photo for on this slide is breaking a window with a ladder. So using the ladder, the tip of the ladder, to actually break the glass. Uh, to do this, you need to first, your first thing is to select the right ladder. It needs to be not too long, not too short, right size that we can get. So in this case, that double stage ladder, the guy standing on on the right hand photo, perfect. Um, you're gonna wanna raise the ladder into the top half of the window. So you just want it touching into that top half of the window and. Um, if you don't want to put it in, or put it right beside it so you can see that it's going to be there when you want when you when you move it over so <clears throat> once it's at the proper height you're going to want to roll the ladder into the window so by just doing a quick little flip and putting it over there you're going to draw back the tip and then you're going to forcibly drop it into that top one-third of the window same as so it's that top one-third again we're going to hit and you're going to strike it like fairly if with, with some good force on uh, with the tip of the ladder. The objective of that technique is actually to push the broken glass into the window opening so fewer shards are going to come down. Some glass will definitely fall. Firefighters still need to be in full PPE when using this technique. Now I'm just going to talk very briefly about it, some of the different uh, some of the different equipment we use for ventilation. Um, up here I've got some pictures, I've got a pike pole, that's pretty straightforward, that's going to be for breaking glass. Um, a PPV fan is the second fan we have here. Um, they, can, uh, they can be either gas or electric. Um, the electric ones are very quiet, uh, but they require a power source, uh, quite straightforward as far as the, uh, you know, the, the disadvantage. But the, the being very quiet is a huge advantage on a fire scene. Um, for those of you who've operated on fire scenes with the fan running, you'll know how loud they are. Um, and the electric fan being that much quieter, they're also really bloody expensive right now and prices are starting to come down. But they can move just as much air as, uh, as, the ga as their gas counterparts can. So. The gas is louder, produce, it produces exhaust fumes, but it doesn't require that external power source. Uh, the next one on uh, the next picture I have there, it's just, that is a smoke ejector. So that's the square box looking thing. Uh, so we use that for negative pressure ventilation, right? They're, they're electric only. They don't come with the, they don't, uh, I, I've never seen a smoke ejector that's uh, gas powered. Now I put a picture of a chainsaw on here. Um, you know, we have, we're limited in our tactical ventilation in terms of what I'm going to be talking about today. A huge component of ventilation, if we did it, would have been the vertical ventilation because of how hazardous it is. There's so many different kinds of roof cuts to do. Um, now, I put a chainsaw on the picture here because we still may need it for horizontal ventilation. Uh, and it would come into play in a situation where the vent exit isn't at that 75% to 200% size I was talking about earlier, we need to make a bigger exit. And a chainsaw can be used to do that. Uh, so again, we're looking at, so that's the one situation typically where we're looking at it, uh, using a chainsaw. We're making a bigger opening or exit for ventilation activities. Other types of equipment we might, might need to use, rotary saws, K12s, uh, things like that. Um, axes, halligan tools, pry bars, uh, tin cutters, uh, you know, utility rope, um, and of course, our, for ourselves, equipment that we need to have is PPE and SCBA, all very important to have. Um, the utility rope can be used, you know, and, and webbing, we can use it to control doors. So by using a loop on a, on a doorknob and tying it off somewhere, we can make sure that that door is not going to close on us during our ventilation activities. Um, so controlling that door is very important and tying it off. So that's where the utility rope comes into Pry bars, uh, halligan bars, well halligan bars and axes, they can be used same as a pike pole for breaking glass. Um, also forcible entry techniques when you're looking at pry bars, right? So there, may, there might be situations where we've got those bars on the window, we've got to break a deadbolt, we've got to force entry into a structure before we're able to ventilate. Um, so just make sure you've got the equipment you're going to need uh, to do your job effectively when if you're put onto a team. And when it comes to being on the vent enter, that may include some forcible entry tools. When we're looking at maintaining our equipment, um, fans, 
they need to be inspected after use and as a part of duty crew. So anytime we've used it, we want to we want to inspect the fan. Every duty crew, we want to inspect the fan, make sure it's got oil, make sure it's got gas, make sure it still runs, and that it's good to go. We're going to be checking for damage, for wear, um, we want and for chainsaws. We want to we want to make sure the the saw is sharp. It's got gas. It's got gas and oil if necessary in it as well. Um, any repairs and maintenance to any of this kind of equipment, as with anything we do, is, is going to be as per the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, and, we want to, and, and the big thing about ventilation is we need to practice. Practice, practice, practice. Practice at training, practice at practice nights, and, and uh, you know, by the time you get to the fire scene and we need to pull this out, we're good to go. Practicing breaking glass can be tough to do. Um, I don't want you going around the fire hall and, and breaking all the glass out of the windows there. Um, it tends to be very expensive and, and uh, not really good for our security. But, but being able to practice this, you know, if you've got the opportunities, please find ways to practice the other techniques. Any, you know, any technique you can practice, if, you get, if we get a acquired structures, making sure that we give people a chance to actually do these things the proper way. So again, ventilation is a huge it is a, is an amazing technique it it does so much for keeping us safe in terms of removing that hot smoking gases from the structure providing us with breathable air confining the fire allowing us to protect structures um, when done properly it, it there's nothing better than ventilation when done poorly it can end up costing lives it can lose us structures and it can create bigger problems than we started with so learning these techniques understanding how they work understanding uh, understanding the principles and the science behind it i highly recommend for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to take the tactical ventilation course another course that i really recommend uh, wayne and randy they've been to the ul facility while they've done the testing on different types of, uh, of ventilation techniques so they are wealth of information. Um, and, and I also ask you to be very careful when, when looking online, because like I said, there are so many improper techniques out there. Understanding that is very important. Um, when I'm creating this kind of material, I'm typically drawing from five or six different you know, resources. And I did that this time too, and I still ended up creating about 80% of what you saw today, because even the information in official books uh, can be misleading at certain times or not complete, incomplete, and missing some of the explanation behind why we do what we do. Uh, but to me, this is one of the greatest techniques, uh, you know, since sliced bread, it's, been, it's, it's since water for us. Um, so learn it, use it, practice it, master it. Thanks very much. I'm going to end, I'm going to stop the recording now.